This week's episode of Dark Side of the Ring is the darkest one so far this season, and it's still early yet, but it's hard to see how it could get much darker than this. This one was really depressing, titled Breaking the Cycle, the Graham Dynasty, focusing on Eddie Graham and his son Mike, both of whom committed suicide. Suicide is really the main theme of this episode, that and alcoholism, and when they run content warnings at the beginning and the end of the episode, you know that it's pretty rough stuff. I thought it gave a a pretty decent overview of their lives as best they could in 43 minutes. Eddie Graham and, and later Mike ran the Florida Territory for many years, and at one time it was one of the hottest territories in the entire country. The Florida office opened in 1949, but uh, it was in 61 that Eddie Graham bought into it, and then a decade later, he took the whole thing over. Tons and tons of big names worked Florida or passed through Florida, but Dusty Rhodes would have to be the one to make, you know, looking back, the biggest impact. It's where Dusty got his big break. He made his name working in Florida, and when Eddie turned him babyface, it set the territory on fire. And Dusty was like a son to him. And Dusty is the one who inducted him into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2008. Jim Cornette was interviewed for this. Kevin Sullivan, who worked in Florida for years and years and was tag team partners and good friends with Mike Graham. Brian Blair, who got his start in Florida. They interviewed an old lady who was a family friend. She was married to the late Don Curtis, who met Eddie in the 50s, and they became good friends. So... She was able to offer some good insight into things being so close to the family for so many years and knowing Eddie personally. But the main person interviewed for this was Nicole Gossett, the daughter of Mike Graham and granddaughter of Eddie Graham. What that woman has gone through has been hell. And she was actually the most uplifting part of this entire episode because she seems to be in a happy place in her life. She's got her own daughter. And she is not following the same path as her father and her grandfather. Eddie was not born Eddie Graham. He was born Eddie Gossett. And changed his name when it was pointed out that he looked a lot like Dr. Jerry Graham, who was another famous wrestler at the time. As Cornette said, brother tag teams were over in New York. And if somebody looked like you, then they would just claim to be brothers. And it worked. I guess had I pursued a career in the ring, uh, Orange Cassidy and I would have been five-time tag team champions by now. The Graham brothers, who called themselves the Golden Grahams, which I think is fucking great. I always loved Golden Grahams. I haven't had them in a while, but still one of my favorite cereals. They were making close to six figures at the time, per year, which would be the equivalent of about a million dollars or more today. The problem was that Dr. Jerry was a raging alcoholic, and he was also mentally ill. He had some problems. So it makes sense why Vince McMahon's father was so upset when he found out that Vince Jr. was running around town with with Graham, Jerry Graham. Jerry Graham was Vince McMahon's favorite wrestler when he was growing up. He wanted to be just like him. Vince has talked about this in, in interviews and personality profiles over the years that he's done. And his father just didn't think that Graham was a very good influence on him. I wonder why. So Cornette said that Graham would go into biker bars and get up in a guy's face and yell, My name is Balls. You got any? Yeah, I could see how that might lead to some trouble. They told the famous, or I guess infamous, story. And I I know I talked about this once before on the podcast. Maybe it was this week in history. Uh... I'll, I'll flesh out some of the details here because Cornette was talking about it and gave some very you know, basic details. But basically what happened is it was 1969 and Jerry Graham's mother died in the hospital. He had been told that she had a heart attack and he called the hospital. He told the doctor, you better hope she gets better, right? A few hours later, she dies. When he got to the hospital, he came with a 12-gauge shotgun in a golf bag he had a 38 caliber revolver and an 8-inch hunting knife on him. So he marches to the intensive care unit. He knocks one of the nurses aside, who's trying to explain to him that his mother's body cannot be moved. He fired the 38 at one of the doctors and missed, thankfully. He grabs the table that has his mother's body on it, and he starts rolling it down the hallway. 
Security tries to intercept him. Now, this is a big man, okay? This guy was well over 300 pounds. He ends up grabbing his mother's corpse and slinging it over his shoulder. And he just kept saying, just leave me alone, leave me alone. I just want to bury her. This It's still one of the craziest stories I've ever heard. Not just in wrestling stories, just in general. But it's all documented in newspaper clippings. This actually happened. He had something like a dozen police officers waiting for him back at the station once the police van got there. Uh, but by that point, I guess he had calmed down. Eddie obviously didn't want to be partners with Jerry anymore, and so he took his family from New York and they moved to Tampa. They set up shop down in Florida. He knew he would get over there. He would be a top star. And he was right. And they did touch on one of his darker traits, though, which was having wrestlers break bones of others who were trying to break into the business. Literally, they broke them into the business as if as if that was the only way to teach them respect was to break their arms or break their legs. You know, Hulk Hogan tells the famous story of Hiro Matsuda breaking his leg. Now, it's Hogan, so you always take what he says with a pound of salt. And Matsuda has never one time mentioned this incident. But again, this this was in Florida. You know, Hogan, he was playing in a band at the time. He quit the band. He was going to try his hand at wrestling after meeting Mike Graham. Matsuda was part owner of the Florida office. You know, he was part of that crew. The fact they did this to other people, I think, does lend credibility to Hogan's story. Uh, Matsuda broke his leg. Hogan was in a cast, supposedly, for about 10 weeks, and then he came back for more. And that's how he broke into the business. He came back. So at that point, they realized, okay, this guy is, is serious, and then they trained him. Kevin Sullivan, in the episode, said the thing that he is most ashamed of, that he's ever done in probably his entire life, um, was bloodying up somebody and, and really beating him up when Eddie Graham told him, look, if this guy doesn't come back bleeding, you're fired. And he says he did it because I had to make a living. I didn't want to, he didn't want to lose his job. He didn't want to get blackballed. So he did what he was told. And he took liberties with whoever this person was. He took liberties with this person. This is the type of shit that went on in the wrestling business back then. I am sure that Eddie Graham was not the only one doing this or giving marching orders for this sort of thing. I just talked about the death of the Iron Sheik last week and the long, famous story that Sheik told about Vern Gagne calling him on the phone before he was defending the title at Madison Square Garden against Hulk Hogan and saying, look, I'll give you $100,000 if you break his leg and bring the belt back to Minnesota. I mean, this is just the type of shit that went on back then. Eddie's main downfall was his drinking. It spiraled out of control. He would always buy a bottle of wine at this store that was open very late before coming home. Uh, I think it, I think they said it was near the airport or whatever, so he would land. He would always go to that store. And then while driving home, once the bottle was finished, he would toss the bottle out the window of his car. One night, the place was closed. And he was so desperate for a drink, he would pull his car over and he would find a bunch of used empty or mostly empty bottles just laying in a nearby field. A lot of them probably were from him tossing them out the window. And he would be on his hands and knees in the dirt fishing around for these bottles and he would drink whatever little droplets were left in the bottle. This was Eddie Graham, you know, the famous wrestler, the, the super successful promoter, one of the most successful promoters in the history of the business. And he is on his hands and knees crawling around in the dirt drinking out of used empty bottles you know when you start doing that i think it's safe to say you've got a drinking problem and you need help so he was out to a restaurant once with his wife and nobody recognized him and that's when reality smacked him in the face and he didn't know how to deal with that you know going from the beloved star that everybody knows to somebody they look at and they don't even recognize it's like who's the old guy uh, his granddaughter said one of the last checks that he ever wrote was to a liquor store for $8. And on the memo line of the check, he wrote, for peace of mind. They had audio of Mike Graham from a shoot interview that he did back in 2010 talking about how he learned of his father's death. He was at the Super Bowl. This was in 1985. It was actually uh, the middle of the pregame show. And he heard his name being paged over the PA system to report to the box office, and he thought it was a joke. When he got to the phone, it was his mother-in-law telling him that his father had shot himself. And he ended up on life support, 
Mike knew that his father wouldn't want to live like that, so he convinced his mother it was time to pull the plug, and five minutes later, he was gone. He did a, a good job of hiding, I guess you would say, whatever it was that was troubling him. It's, it's not that people didn't know about his problems with alcohol, but nobody expected to find out that Eddie Graham shot himself. That was shocking. And in the episode, they portray it as his alcohol problems led to the suicide. And, and I'm, I have no doubt that that probably played a pretty damn big role. But they didn't cover the land deal at all. That was never mentioned in the episode. And I, I do think that's a key part of the story and played at least some role in what happened. So I think it should have been mentioned. So I'll mention it here. This is from an article. In the Orlando Sentinel, September 22nd, 1985. So this was later the same year that Eddie Graham killed himself. While his wife was out, Graham went to another room where he kept a cabinet stocked with several rifles and handguns. He removed a five-shot 38 caliber blue steel Smith & Wesson revolver, inserted one bullet, returned to the bedroom, and lied face up in the bed, dressed only in his underwear. He put the gun to the right temple and pulled the trigger. Afterwards, when Mike went through his father's papers, he would find notes that Eddie had written to himself during those weeks and months of, of brooding. Only then did his family begin to realize what he had been going through. Mike will not share the notes, but he says that they may hold a clue as to why his father ended his own life. I've been conned, one note said and the embarrassment is too much to stand. How Eddie Graham came to know Cullen Buster Williams is unclear. Williams, a dirt hauler and land speculator who was on parole for a 1983 mail fraud conviction, was recently one of 25 people indicted in a federal racketeering indictment, alleging bribery and corruption involving the Hillsborough County Commission. He refused to discuss his relationship with Graham for this article, Graham's friends, though, say the pair had a common background. Both were born poor, dropped out of high school, succeeded in a rugged business, and got involved in community work for kids. When Williams was sentenced for mail fraud, Graham was among those there to give him moral support. Graham told his friends that he was investing in some kind of land owned by Williams on Northdale Mabry Highway in Tampa, and that he hoped he could get into the dirt hauling business with his new partner. On April 5th, 1984, Graham borrowed $500,000 from Park Bank in St. Petersburg. But rather than an investment in land, the money became an investment in Buccaneer Land Development Corporation, the company that had bought out Williams' failed company. On June 26th, Buccaneer President James Shallow signed a note agreeing that the company would reimburse Graham for his loan. The company was having financial problems, however, and very soon was not making its payments to Graham. How involved Williams was in Buccaneer, however, is a matter of dispute, says the firm's lawyer. But he says Graham got involved in it because of Buster Williams. He perceived it as being a good investment on his part. Three days before his death, Graham called his son, who was leaving with his wife for the Super Bowl in San Francisco. He said, Mike, I love you. I said, Dad, I know that. We weren't real mushy, but there was never any doubt as regards to love. It struck me funny. I said, Dad, what's wrong? He said, I just never told you before, and I wanted you to know. The day before he died, Graham had breakfast in Tampa with his friend Ed Blackburn, the former Hillsborough County Sheriff, who now lives in Tallahassee. I never saw him so depressed in all his life, Blackburn recalls. He had all these obligations coming due, and he had no way to meet them. Eddie had a good name, and he was real jealous of it. He said, to let myself get conned by those people, I just don't understand. Blackburn said, I told my wife as we drove back to Tallahassee that I was going to call a priest and have him talk to him, and he never had a chance to make that call. Lucy Gossett says she, can, she still can't answer the question of why. The financial problems he perceived never arrived. Park Bank did not foreclose on the loan, but is waiting on the sale of land that Buccaneer used as collateral for its loan from Graham. One of his friends said, I had told Eddie he had nothing to worry about. His financial problems were all self-perceived. So again, that's a pretty important detail there, because given the timeline of events, it, it sure seems like that whole financial situation uh, may have played a pretty big role 
in Eddie Graham taking his own life. And again, none of this was ever even uh, briefly mentioned here in the episode, but I thought it was worth mentioning. So within a year, the territory was on its last legs. Between losing Eddie, who Cornette says he was the one guy who could have made it work, with Vince McMahon raiding all of the territories because Vince Sr. liked Eddie, and so did Vince Jr., but without him there, Mike, you know, he tried to make it work and he just couldn't do it. And Sullivan says it wasn't Vince so much as it was Dusty. You know, when Dusty left, even before Eddie died, when Dusty left the territory, he took half the territory with him to Crockett Promotions. And Mike said that made his father mad considering how Florida was the place that made Dusty and how close they were. Uh, Mike went on to go work for WCW first as a wrestler and then later on behind the scenes. Mike Graham is the one who famously said that Jeff Jarrett broke 6,000 guitars and never drew a dime. And he is also the one, little trivia note here, who was very likely responsible for Chris Benoit, Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko, and Perry Saturn all being granted their releases from WCW so they could go make the jump to WWE. Because think about it. Why the hell would WCW, as, as, again, I know all the stories about WCW and how haywire things were behind the scenes, but why would WCW allow all four of those guys at the same time out of their contracts? Like on its face, it just doesn't make any sense until you learn that Mike Graham threatened Chris Benoit. And when Benoit complained to Human Resources, they were all granted their releases all of a sudden. Graham was on the booking committee in 2000. And as he told the story to Sean Oliver once upon a time, Benoit had been messing around with Nancy. Now, we knew, this part we know. Benoit had been, you know, basically having an affair with Kevin Sullivan's wife. Chris Benoit and Nancy Sullivan were messing around while she was still married to Kevin Sullivan. Kevin got the booking job years later in WCW. So he puts the world title, he puts the big gold belt on Benoit to show that he's willing to be fair to this guy. You know, whatever concerns Benoit had and was voicing to management, you know, because he wanted out. I mean, once he learned that Sullivan got the book, he figured he was fucked. So this was Sullivan's way of showing, look, I can be a good soldier, right? I'm going to treat you like I would treat anybody else. Even with Graham telling him not to do it because Benoit, he said Benoit's not a world champion, he doesn't look like one, he never drew a dime. That was Mike Graham's whole thing. Nobody ever drew a dime. This guy never drew a dime, that guy never drew a dime. So then he finds out that Benoit asked for him, Sullivan, and I believe it was uh, J.J. Dillon, to all be fired. So he went and he found Benoit in the building, and he said, you're trying to get me fired because I'm friends with Sullivan? And he claims he told Benoit, I'll cut your fucking head off and I'll put it on a stick in front of your house for all the kids to throw rocks at. I could see why that would be problematic. To have one of your executives threatening to behead one of the wrestlers. And look what it led to, right? That was a big coup at the time for WWE to get the radicals and bring them all in at the same time. So you have Mike Graham to thank for that. But anyway, his own drinking got worse after his father died. He was racking up DUIs under two different licenses, by the way. One with his shoot name and then one with the, the Mike Graham name. Then his son commits suicide. In 2010, he was only 37 years old. And Nicole is the one who found her brother. Because they hadn't heard from him. She goes, I'll go check on him. And she found her brother. Uh, that sent Mike into an even deeper depression. Sullivan said one day he gets a call from Mike telling him he loved him. Out of the blue. Eerily reminiscent of what Mike's father said to him before he took his life. And Nicole said she told her father, this ends with Stephen. Stephen was her brother. Uh, you know, her, her grandfather died by his own hand. Her brother died by his own hand. And she told her father, it has to stop. Right? I have a daughter. She, she told Mike, look at her. This is your granddaughter here. She needs you. She doesn't deserve this. And she says Mike agreed. And then less than two years later, he killed himself. One self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. And when they found him, he was wearing his son's cowboy boots. You know, it's, it's hard to take all of this in. It's just so fucking depressing. 
And then you find out that it's so much worse than you even thought it was. Because it didn't start with Eddie Graham. Eddie's father committed suicide. And Eddie's brother, Skip, also committed suicide. Then Eddie, then Mike, or actually Mike's son first, and then Mike. That's why I say, you know, when I think of tragic wrestling families, I think of the Von Erichs first, but then I think of the Graham family. Five men across four generations all taking their own lives. How do you even begin to comprehend that? You know, Mike's daughter thinks her grandfather doing it maybe made it easier for Mike and Mike's son to do it. Because in a way, it's almost like, well, you know, he did it. So all of a sudden it becomes an option. That, you know, maybe they wouldn't have thought about otherwise. Whatever it was they may have been dealing with at the time. But then how does that explain Eddie's father taking his own life? I don't I don't know the circumstances behind that, so I can't say. I'm just I'm trying to figure out how this happens. Like is it is it hereditary? Is there some sort of suicide gene that makes them predisposed to this type of behavior? I don't even know that such a thing exists, but I mean, how else do you explain it? But they ended on a positive note. Believe it or not, after everything I just said, they ended on a positive note with Nicole taking us to what used to be the old armory in Florida. Uh, which is now a Jewish community center. And her showing us the photos on one of the walls, like a giant wrestling mural. And on one of the walls, they have pictures of some of the old wrestlers from the territory, pictures of her dad and her grandfather. And it's it's very nice. You know, it's it's there so that championship wrestling from Florida will always have a home. And she said she focuses on all the good times that she had with her family, all the happy memories that she has. And she says she's never been happier than she is today. You know, she she's a survivor. In the same way that Kevin Von Erich is for his family. She also founded the Crisis Center of Tampa Bay to help get the word out for people who need help. That there are people to talk to out there, even if you think you're alone. You are never alone. And I echo that, because I know there are people listening to this right now that have either tried to harm themselves or know someone who has. There's always someone to talk to, even if you think that there isn't, even if you think that nobody cares. But this was a tough watch. You know, sometimes there's just no good way to sugarcoat a story. It's just a downer no matter how you look at it. But I'm glad that she at least is in a good place considering all that she's gone through.